Well, hey everybody, welcome to another episode and thank you for checking in once again. And today's episode is called Don't Be There, Be Square. So what we're going to look at, obviously, is the world of square photography. That is shooting in the square format. Now, my first experience with the square format was with this camera here. This is a Polaroid camera. It's called the Instant 20. This isn't the exact one I use, but it did look exactly like this, apart from being called the Super Color Swinger, which I think perhaps is a name that might not be used today, <laughs> but who knows. But yeah, this is where I first became familiar with the square format. I don't know if you can see on the on the box here, a little image there is in a square format. And that's what you got out of a Polaroid camera. They used a very, very large negative, essentially a medium format negative that was contact printed in this model onto the print. And it was in the square format format and that is how I did a lot of my early photography with was uh, with this camera using the square format. I've recently become re-inspired to explore the square format because of this beautiful old camera here the Rolleiflex which I've been using off and on uh, for the past uh, few days past couple of weeks maybe. Um, and that's what's inspired my interest. And I found that shooting in the square format is just a little different than shooting in uh, uh, either a landscape rectangular format or indeed in, in the portrait format. It's, it's just a little different and it forces you to think in different visual ways. It's not necessarily better, although it can be better. And uh, sometimes recently I've found myself thinking, gosh, yes, this really is a better format than uh, landscape or portrait. But of course, it's not always necessarily better. But a simple change of aspect ratio can affect your, fo your photography. And in my case, it's opened up a whole new dimension and approach to photography. Just that simple change to a square format has really opened my eyes and I don't know, just sort of given me a new way of doing things and, and, and it's been actually very refreshing. Now if you think about it, square, the square format was very, 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 very popular for many, 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 many years. If you think about the popular photography of the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s and 50s. Most people, most popular photography was done using either a box brownie or a bullet camera or something similar to that. Something that would shoot either 120 or maybe 620 or 127 film. And all of those films gave a square or more or less square, exactly square in the case of 120, uh, but I think they're all more or less square image. So that was the the image of popular photography for many, 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 many years was the square format. And if you happen to have any of your parents or your grandparents images from the 20s, 30s or 40s, you'll find that pretty much almost all of them are square. There were 35 mil cameras, of course, available during the 20s, 30s, 40s, but they tended to be very expensive cameras like the Leica, like the Contax. And do correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think um, popular uh, style, uh, cheaper 35mm cameras really came into use until maybe the 60s, maybe the mid 60s, 70s, sometimes, certainly the early 60s perhaps the late 50s, but it wasn't in the, until later on that 35mm permeated 
popular photography. And of course, the square format continued even beyond that time, even after 35mm became popularly available. There were Polaroid cameras. Many, many people shot these Polaroid cameras, either this model or an SX-70, if, uh, if you could afford it. Um, there was also 110 film that had a, uh, it was a very, very small negative, but it was a square negative. If you've ever shot one of those, or if your parents, grandparents have any old 110 shots, you'll see they're a square negative. Uh, I think, actually, Lomography have just released a new 110 camera, so you can experiment with 110 squareness all you like. And of course, the popular apps like uh, Hipstamatic, that shoots a square frame. Instagram, as far as I understand it, the many, many or most of the images are square on Instagram. So this is not a format that has been lost by any means and uh, it continues right up to the present day. And of course the square format used to be the choice of the professional photographer. Certainly during the 30s, 40s, 50s, many, many, many of the big names shot with uh, the square format on 120, very often actually with a, with a Roliflex just like this, but of course with all the 120 cameras, names like Vivian Meyer, Cecil Beaton, many, many of the great names of the past use this square format. So it's, it's in the consciousness there, it's, it's, it's in the photographic psyche, if you like, and uh, we are very familiar with it, even though it may have lost some of its popularity over recent years. It's, it's, it's still sort of there in the, in the psyche because so many people, uh, so many of the big names, so many of the iconic images were made with it. Now it's the old Roliflex here that's encouraged me to experiment with the square format, just looking down at that finder, that beautiful ground glass square finder, and uh, appreciating uh, the composition that you need to do in uh, square photography. That's just inspired me to make some images with my X-T3 in square format. And I have found that composition is a little different than if you're using the rectangular format, either in landscape or in portrait mode. You can use the rule of thirds in uh, square photography. It's very important in, in rectangular photography. The rule of thirds is where you take your frame and you divide it into horizontal thirds and vertical thirds, and you put your center of interest on one of those points uh, where the lines cross. It's a very, very good compositional tool. It really, really works in the rectangular format. I think it's based on the Fibonacci sequence of numbers. Again, please do correct me if you know better if I'm wrong. But I think it's based on the Fibonacci sequence. The ancient Greeks used it in their golden section. If you've ever seen that rectangle with the spiral in it and the golden section, and they used it for a lot of their buildings and it was the basis of their sense of proportion and harmony. How they discovered it, I really can't imagine, but they did. They were clearly very, very smart people and they knew about it too. And it's a really good compositional tool for rectangular format images. Now, you can use it in square images, you know, absolutely no problem. You can certainly use the rule of thirds, but generally it's not so important as it is in the landscape format. The square format encourages you to use the center. It encourages you to place your subject right bang in the center of the shot, maybe as close as you can, maybe pull back a little bit, still the center is important and the space around it is less important. I found it's really um, a medium, a format, a shape that 
really inherently has this ability to just put the uh, subject right bang in the center of the frame and for it to really work in a way that it wouldn't work if you did it landscape or portrait. So a shot can have more impact because there's really no other space to explore. The subject is clearly and plainly in the center and the eye is not really encouraged to explore any other space. And you could say that, in fact, it's probably true to say, in certain cases anyway, that it rids the shot of unnecessary distractions and it really can actually improve composition. There is simply less to think about in composition and the square format just seems to lend itself to naturally beautiful compositions. There's far, far less to think about. It kind of feels to me, it kind of feels like a, a, a special little window into something. Whereas the rectangular format, we're sort of free to look, there are no restrictions. Whereas the square format, it's like a special little window into a special little area. A bit like the square window in play school, if anybody remembers that. But that's how it feels, it's like, it's like being allowed access into something a little bit special. So it can be a really effective way to simplify an image, to just get your viewer, get your audience to concentrate on that image, simply and only that image. And it simplifies the act of looking. It also simplifies the act of shooting as well, or, or, or so it seems to me. It seems to lend itself well to minimalist forms, to minimalist subjects that emphasize shape and form. Just, you know, everyday objects in the world around you, um, shadows, reflections. It, it, it just seems to lend itself to that sort of, those sorts of minimalist subjects without focusing the eye on too many extraneous details um, and it also works rather well for geometric forms I've found. I, I, I do like shooting geometric forms, they're one of my favourite things to shoot along with graffiti, pictures of graffiti, pictures of people smoking. I do love geometric forms and I've found that the square shape, there's something about the rectilinear nature of that square shape. I know that landscape is rectilinear too, but there's something about that square shape that just seems to emphasize little geometrical details, lines, forms, patterns. Uh, and I found it very uh, useful for that and I've found it to really lend itself very very well to that. It can deal with space better because there's less of it, there's just simply less distraction for the eye. The eye is focused right onto the subject and that's pretty much the end of it. Now, conventional wisdom has it, and I'm sure this is true, conventional wisdom has it, that in uh, a portrait-orientated uh, rectangular image, the eye is encouraged to move up and down. In a landscape rectangular image, the eye is encouraged to move side to side and scan the image that way. But in a square image, the eye is encouraged to move in a circular motion. There's not really very far for the eye to go, so it explores the image more carefully and it's directed right on to the subject. And these various formats, these various shapes do seem to work in that way. Negative space seems to work better in the square format. Negative space is the area, the space around the subject that's not really doing the same amount of visual work as the subject is. It's sort of the, the, the area around the subject. And it can give a more balanced composition. 
and it can also give a, 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 a much more centered composition as well. I found it easier to create an effective composition using the square format. I, I spent less time composing. I spent less time thinking about, you know, is this image absolutely right? It just seemed to present itself instinctively. I could instinctively see when it was right more easily than in a rectangular format. It's more immediately obvious when you're composed correctly, or so I found. So what I would recommend, I'm going to say it again, because I enjoy saying it, is don't be there, be square. Try it, give it a go. Um, use an old 120 camera. Um, use your iPhone. Um, of course, any mirrorless camera will shoot in the square format these days. Give it a go and see if your experiences echo mine. And let me know what you think about the square format. Let me know what your favourite uh, format is to shoot in. I'd be very interested to know and I'd be very interested to know why also. So I guess that is it from me for now. I hope this episode has been interesting, instructional or otherwise enjoyable. Thank you very, very much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you've enjoyed this show and if you like the stuff on this channel, do chuck us a sub. That would be appreciated. Many, many thanks go to subscribers. Thank you very, very much for your support. Many, many thanks also go to patrons. Thank you very, very much for your support. Also, thank you, thank you to anyone who has watched the show, who's given thanks, who's given super thanks, or has in any way engaged with this little channel. Many, many thanks, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. As for me, that is it, I think, for this week. So it remains only to thank you all for watching. And as usual, if you're not doing anything too bothersome, irritating, irksome, annoying or troubling next time, next week at around this time, please do check in for another episode of Xenography. Cheerio all.